turn the conference over to your host, Brett Graves. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks, Ashley. I'd like to welcome each of you to this Sharp 2 NDS training webinar. Today we'll be talking about the Roadway Information Database. This is the second webinar in a series of four training sessions related to the Sharp 2 NDS and Roadway Information Database presented by FHWA's Safety Training and Analysis Center, or STAC. The STAC is located at Turner Fairbanks Highway Research Center and is FHWA's primary implementation effort related to the Sharp 2 NDS and the RID. Our presentation today will last about an hour with a half an hour allotted for question and answer. If you have any questions during the session, feel free to enter those into the chat pod as we go, and we'll answer those during the Q&A session. And as Ashley mentioned, we'll also open it up for folks to ask questions verbally. Now I'd like to turn it over to Charles Fay. Charles Fay is the Sharp 2 Research Manager for FHWA Safety Training and Analysis Center. Charles? Okay, thanks, Brett. Um, so as Brett mentioned, the stack is FHWA's main uh, implementation effort related to the Sharp 2 uh, Naturalistic Driving Study and Roadway Information Database. This slide highlights our four goals and supporting activities. So the supporting activities are uh, outlined by the bullet points under the goals. Not going to spend too much time on this. We talked about this during the first webinar. Um, but basically, the four goals are to expand understanding, and that's where the training webinars come into place, to expand access to the data, including uh, personal identifiable information, or PII, to expand usability of the data through the development of various data analytic tools and reduce data sets. And I also wanted to highlight under expand user base uh, the second bullet. So we're here for any of the state DOTs that are thinking about uh, scooping out their own work with the Sharp 2 data. Uh, we're here to help support you in that development, uh, such as uh, helping you uh, develop a, a request for proposals. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the fourth bullet, uh, the Sharp 2 uh, NDS pooled fund study number 1427. Uh, that solicitation is currently online uh, on the pooled fund website, and the solicitation is currently open till um, March of 2017. And with that, I'll turn it back to Brett. All right, thank you. Here's the uh, contact information for the folks at the stack. We can put this up again at the end uh, if you have any questions for them. Uh, Omar Smadi from the Iowa State uh, University uh, Center for Transportation Research and Engineering will be providing the main portion of our training session today. Omar is a professor of civil engineering at Iowa State University and the CTREE director at Intrans. He conducts safety and asset management research, and he was the PI on the original project to develop the roadway information database. And I'll turn it over to you, Omar. All right. Uh, thank you, Brett, and uh, thanks, uh, Charles, for uh, introducing what the stack is doing. As uh, Brett said, this is the second webinar in a four-webinar series, and uh, this afternoon we will be talking about uh, the roadway portion of the naturalistic driving study that was uh, conducted by SHARP2 and uh, TRB and the National Academies. With me this afternoon are uh, both uh, Zach Hans and uh, Skylar Knickerbocker. They were both instrumental in the development of the roadway information database and also providing support now to the researchers that are using the RID. We'll do this as a tag team. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the RID in general. Uh, Zach is going to cover uh, an example in terms of how we use the roadway information database. And also Scholar is going to cover uh, another example of uh, GIS uh, capabilities or uh, functionalities. Uh, C3 is doing this work under a subcontract to uh, LIDOS for Federal Highway Turner Fairbank. So uh, what we will cover uh, this afternoon, and I know it's probably morning for some of you on the uh, West Coast, is we're going to tell you what is the roadway information database, uh, what are some of the data. We probably don't have enough time to talk about all the data that is part of the RID. And then we want to focus in terms of how do we really use the RID and discuss some example research questions in terms of how researchers, safety researchers, or in some cases even asset management and operations researchers are using the RID 
to support their research, whether uh, in terms of just taking the information from the RID or expanding their uh, data request to uh, request NDS data or driver and vehicle data from uh, VTTI. So that's really our objective and goal for the second uh, webinar. So as part of the SHARP-2 uh, safety study or the naturalistic driving study, uh, VTTI and we have both Miguel and Susie Lee are on the line too if, if there are questions at the end. We're in charge of collecting the, the vehicle, the driver data uh, for the NDS study. Uh, our role was for the roadway data and our role was to design, build and populate a roadway information database that is linked to the NDS database to facilitate uh, the addressing research questions uh, related to safety. So it's, uh, it's putting basically the roadway, the vehicle and the driver all in a single environment uh, to be able to address those uh, safety questions. So that was really our major objective and goal in developing the RID. So when we're talking about roadway data, we're talking about a huge set of data that describes the roadway characteristics that we have. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with the, the SHARP-2 study, it was conducted in six states. So you can imagine the scope of the roadway data that we needed to deal with. In some cases, we had to uh, ignore certain aspects of the data if they were not consistent among the six study sites also data that was hard to come by. So part of this process was to work with uh, researchers and users uh, of, of the data to look at what is really critical for those researchers to get. And we ended up with this list of data sources that became part of the RID. Uh, we had existing data. Uh, we have estimated about 200,000 miles. Uh, that came from the six the Department of Transportation is where the study took place. And I'll, I'll remind the, the listeners of the six study sites. We, we had a site in Tampa, Florida. Uh, we had a site in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. A uh, site in uh, Buffalo, New York. There was a site in uh, State College, uh, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Indianapolis, Bloomington, and then Seattle, Washington. So those were the six. Uh, study site. So we were able to capture uh, existing data from the six DOTs at varying levels. We also collected supplemental information that were not necessarily roadway related, but they were critical in further characterizing or analyzing operations of the roadway segment. One big portion of developing the RID was the collection of uh, mobile data. Uh, and this, of course, was limited based on the, the budget that we had. We ended up collecting about 25,000 miles in those six study sites. We also have been working on creating reduced data sets that facilitates uh, research in certain areas without the researchers having the uh, advanced GIS capabilities to be able to produce these data sets themselves, and we'll chat a little bit more about that later on. And then we also incorporated the Highway Performance Monitoring System data, or HPMS data, as part of the RID, because that's, again, it's a national data set that is available across all states, so we were able to capture uh, this information and make it part of the RID. So my uh, few next slides will uh, talk a little bit more about each one of those uh, data items. So the existing data, we've obtained that from the, the six states. The information varied by state in terms of a roadway extent, in terms of the content of the data and the attributes that we were able to get, and also the format of that data. Uh, just to give you a, a quick example, a state like North Carolina uh, manages the majority of the states and the roads. The DOT in North Carolina manages every road that is outside city limits. So in the case of North Carolina, I think we have 70 or 75,000 miles of roads under the state network, while in Washington state, 
we're only talking about the miles that Washington State DOT manages, and that's only about 9,000 miles. So you can see the difference, at least in this case, in terms of the extent. Uh, a state, again, like Washington, gave us a lot of information. They had a curvature data set. They have a, uh, a sign data set. Uh, we've got uh, information in terms of parcel data. So they had a rich data set that they provided to us. Uh, a state like, uh, remind me, Zach, Indiana only had a flat file with all of their uh, information in just one, one file. They had limited uh, data. So that information varied from one state to another. One thing to keep in mind, though, is we took all of that data and related it back to the RID, to the location referencing system that we used in the RID, but also retain the raw data so you can actually work with that DOT data without uh, uh, using the RID. Uh, and that's critical because in some cases, the conflation process in terms of uh, putting the DOT data or the existing data on the LRS might have some issues. We might have missed some data items. So we wanted to make sure that all the source data was retained. And as researchers, you have access to that if you have a copy of the RID and you can work with that independently of the RID. The second uh, category of, of data is the supplemental data. And uh, I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of what we have there. We'll start with the crash data. We're able to get uh, five years before the NDS experiment started, which is in before 2011. And then we collected the crash data during the experiment up to 2013. These are the police reported crashes. Uh, and, uh, we have, as I said, we have six states. We were able to get uh, all the crashes from five states and the uh, site in North Carolina. I think we were able to get the crashes for 19 counties that were in the study area. We also have traffic information, so traffic counts. Uh, this is really a lot of variability there between one state to another. You know, some states provided 24-hour uh, counts. Some states provided 48 counts. Uh, of course, there is also HP traffic data is in the HPMS, and that's a standard format that every state has to report. Weather data, we obtained weather from three different sources. All that weather data uh, is based on stations, and it has a lat log that you can uh, link to the RID. For example, the weather data was not directly conflated to the RID because of the huge amount of data that we have, and also the fact that we left that up to the researchers to decide how to use the weather data and how that would impact their research questions. We also documented the state laws before and during the study in terms of cell phone use, texting, G GDL, graduated driver license, and seat belt. Uh, we were able to get all the aerial imagery for the six locations. Uh, we the Researchers and users of the data believe that this data will be used for at least 20, if not more years. And we know how things are changing and in terms of archiving data. So we wanted to have a permanent record of what the roads looked like when the experiment happened. So we maintained all of those aerial imageries from the time of the experiment. We tried to capture changes to the infrastructure after we collected data. Projects like you know adding lanes and and signalizing intersections, we were not as successful with it, but at least we we tried to capture this information, and then we tried to capture 511 information from the six study sites. I think we we only missing one site, uh, Indiana. We did not have 511 information coming from Indiana, but this is again information that the users can the researchers can use to enhance their research questions and uh, update their data requests. From the supplemental data perspective, this is where a lot of the variability came in. Uh, some supplemental data was not available for specific states. As I said, you know, the 511 data. Again, all the data we received is retained in its, in its original format. Uh, some of it has been conflated to the LRS. Some have, have not. Here are you know, some of the data, the roadway data that could be related to the roadway network. 
uh, we were able to conflate, which when we're talking about conflation is actually putting that data on the route network that we use for the RID, which is consistent among the six uh, study sites. That route network came from uh, NAVTEC, ESRI, uh, and that is consistent among the six study sites. There were some non-conflated data, basically data that sometimes is not related to roadways. Uh, the weather data is a great example of uh, non-conflated data. Those are returned in an additional supplemental data folder. They are part of the RID, but researchers will have to do a little bit more work to take that data and relate it back to the RID. We also have metadata for the majority of the data items that we have. Metadata is uh, complete for the mobile data. Uh, we have some metadata for the state data uh, or the existing data. Uh, it's, it's sketchy in some locations because of the, you know, we, we did not spend time to come up with the metadata. If the owners of the data had it, then we provided it as part of the RID. The third uh, data source is the mobile data. This was collected by Fugro Roadware. Uh, the, all of that data was conflated to the RID. This is the most consistent and most accurate information because it went through a quality assurance process. The elements we collected were alignment in terms of uh, point of curvature, point of tangent, radius length, direction, and super elevation for curves, location information, basically where the vehicle drove, and we collected grade and cross slope. Uh, for every 21-foot intervals. We have a data set for barrier type, the start and end treatment and the post material, lighting, whether it's present or not, uh, lane information in terms of the number, type, and width, shoulder information, all the signs on the network in terms of the MUTCD and the message, uh, guardrail information, intersection, the type of intersection or control, the number of approaches, of course, the location, uh, a data set for rumble strip or stripes, medians, and then we had a front right-of-way video log that allows users to basically drive that network the way the, the vehicle drove it when the data was collected. Here is just a, a, a map showing the number of miles we collected. I told you we had about a little bit over 25,000 miles. Here is the distribution among the six study sites. The gray is basically all the major roads in the network, and then the colored lines are what we collected with mobile data. And so you can see it's a small portion of the network that was collected, but those, those 25,000 miles were focused on the study areas where we had volunteer drivers. Uh, we went through a process of prioritizing routes uh, we, we really didn't know how we would do in terms of how efficient we were with those 25,000 miles that we collected, but it turned out that 70% of the trips, which I think we have 5 million, over 5 million trips, happened on the miles where we have mobile data. So for the majority of the research questions, uh, you can definitely have a lot of the detailed information that came from the mobile data to support your research questions since 70% of the trips happened over those miles. So we think we did really well uh, working with uh, TRB and VTTI in selecting those routes, and we ended up with 70% of the routes because we wanted to collect the mobile data while the drivers were on the road. So it was, it was uh, a chicken and egg kind of thing. To, uh, we, if we don't know where they're driving, uh, we can't really collect the roads, but uh, with 70%, I think we did really well with that. The mobile data, as I said, is the most accurate information and consistent among the study si six study sites. We ended up uh, doing uh, a QA process, so we had minimum accuracy requirements. This is just a simple example of some of the items, you know, for example, point of curvature, we want it to be plus minus uh, 50 feet. On the lane width, we want it to be plus minus one. On any inventory feature in terms of a location of a feature, we want it to be plus minus within seven feet from that. Uh, to ensure this, we had control sites, uh, two of them per, per location, one for urban and one for rural, that 
the vendor had to collect and we had to certify. And then we went out and did random checks in those six study sites where we just drove roads, we stopped, collected data, and then compared that data to what the vendor provided. Uh, our accuracy requirements needed to be met 95% of the time, and we had no, no issues with that. Here is just an example of the RID in, in a GIS environment. You can see on the left side we have the mobile data, then the existing data, which in this case, since we're looking at North Carolina, came from the North Carolina DOT, and then the HPMS data or the Highway Performance Monitoring System data, the underlying route network, which came from Esri Naftec, which we call the LRS data, and then we would have supplemental data. We also had railroad crossing from the FRA. So this is just a simple representation of the, the uh, RID, the way it would look in the GIS environment. All the green roads are all the roads uh, that we were provided uh, from the Esri Naptic network, and then the red lines represent where mobile data was collected. Uh, the RID works in the Esri ArcMap. Uh, I know we've got some questions in the past in terms of, uh, you know, can you produce shape files? Can you produce this data in a flat file? Uh, all of these are possibilities, but they would require a lot of work. So at this point, the best option to access the data is to have uh, an, an, an Esri license for ArcMap uh, to be able to utilize and use the information. Here is a slide just kind of showing some of the attributes we collected with mobile data. And, and you can see, you know, we have over 500,000 signs. Uh, we have uh, over 11,000 miles of rumble strips. We have 7,000 miles of lighting. Again, this is just the presence of lighting. We really don't know if the lighting was functional or is functional or not, but at least it shows you where we have lighting. There are about 6,000 miles of barriers, 43,000 intersections, 10,000 miles of medians, almost 40, a little bit over 44,000 curves, and 33,000 miles of paved on unpaved shoulders. So you can see the the, <clears throat> the range of the values that we have. So when you're trying to come up with the research questions, one of the things you want to do is to see if you have enough data, especially if you're starting from the roadway side. You know, I want to work with uh, curves that have this radius that are right direction and are longer than a certain amount. You can easily go into the RID, and, and Skylar will show you later on one of the examples that we have, and see how many of those do you have. This is the simplest thing that you can do because that information exists. If you can't find enough locations, then that's where you would go and look for uh, data from the DOT or other sources to be able to build your research question. But if you, if you do it through the mobile data and you have enough segments or locations identified, then you're on your way to basically starting a data request with your research question. So we, we want to emphasize the, having the ability to do these quick queries to be able to determine the feasibility of the research question. Uh, I also talked about uh, the video log that was collected. Those were high definition images that were collected uh, for the 25,000 miles. And when, when we talk about 25,000 miles, those are really 12,500 center line miles because we collected data in two directions because we wanted to get a full inventory of the, of the signs and also provide uh, the video log, which uh, you can access that through the RedView uh, web server that we have here at Entran. So if you, if you have a copy of the RID, then we will give you access to RedView that allows you to, to uh, look at basically the, the, the locations that you're interested in, the images that were captured, and some uh, basic data. This is, uh, this is a web service that you can call, and you can actually query locations and, and go to that uh, location. You can, the images were captured every 21 foot. So you can play those images like you're driving the, the road uh, at the same time. We talked just a little bit about the linear referencing system. I just want to touch a little bit on that in terms of what, what, how we used it and, and what's really the main objective for it. We wanted to have a consistent 
underlying network of the roads that uh, we're using to build the RID. And that system of the roadway center line possesses basically a unique route identifier, a direction, and then a from measure and a to measure. And once I have a from measure and to measure, then I can calculate a length. So every route in the RID, and when we say a route, we're really not talking about a specific road. We're not talking about Interstate 5 or US 69 or 3rd Street. We're talking about a route segment the way NAVTEC and ESRI digitized that route segment and identified it. So you might have one uh, road that has multiple routes in it, and each route will have a from and a to measure. So that's kind of the basic building block in terms of our underlying road network. Now, in this case, we're showing you how the blue line basically shows us the, the underlying network that we just talked about. The red line is data from a state DOT. Uh, the way the state DOT maintain their data is, prob is different than uh, other state DOTs maintain it and also is different than the NAVTIC and ESRI data that we use for the LRS. But because we have location information, we're able to conflate that state data, or it could be data from other sources, to the LRS. And now that becomes part of the RID. Now the data that we conflated now will have a route ID, will have a from measure and to measure. And having that ability would allow users to integrate data, allows, you, allows users to use dynamic segmentation to query data and create separate or specific data sets to allow them to answer their research questions. That ability is very critical, and that's why we try to uh, conflate a lot of the roadway data that we had our hands on to allow the users to use it in this way. And we'll show you a simple example in terms of how that data is integrated. Here is just a, a sample of the database structure. This represents the mobile data. This is actually an actual uh, segment that we collected data on. Every data item or data attribute is uh, stored in a simple table that still has a route ID from and a to measure. And so in this case, for when we're looking at lanes, we will have lanes, and in this case, we have a, a through lane and a left turn lane, I think. And then we have an intersection, which, uh, Zach, what, what kind of lanes do we have here? I can see here. The lane. Oh, there's a turn lane. Yep. And then, and then we have other information. So that lane database, there would be a record every time the lane information is, is consistent. The same thing here, you know, we have median. If we don't have a median, we will not have a record. When we have a median, we will have a record that says what type of median it is and the beginning and end of that median. Uh, same information for shoulders. If we don't have a shoulder, then there would be no shoulder. And then maybe in this case, it's a two-foot paved shoulder and so on. The location information uh, is basically the entire data set. It's continuous. It's every 21 feet. And then we have a grade and cross slope measure for each one of those records. But each one of those data sets is maintained as a separate table but they are all linked to the LRS, which allows the users to ask questions like, show me all the segments that have a paved shoulder that is more than four foot wide, that is also, uh, that has two lanes or more in each direction, and so on, because all of that information has a route ID and a from and to measure that you can link back to. to to be able to work with the RID, uh, you can go to our website and download a sample RID from the website. This is a sample uh, data set from the mobile data. Uh, I think we picked around uh, 30 miles, uh, Skylar, from the Tampa area. We tried to pick urban and rural areas and show you the range of the data that is there. So download that sample, familiarize yourself with it. Uh, you do have to have some GIS experience to be able to uh, work with the data. Uh, so uh, experiment with that. Determine what roadway attributes are needed. Then depending on how comfortable you feel with GIS, you can request uh, to get a copy of the RID. You have to sign uh, a terms of use agreement. 
and then there is a charge of $750 to get a copy of the RID. We will send you a hard disk. It's almost one terabyte, so the RID is uh, 890 gigabytes, I think. It will have the mobile data, it will have the existing data, it will also have the aerial imageries and all the supplemental data. Uh, the mobile data, the RID itself, all the data that is conflated to the LRS is 60 gigabyte, I think, Skylar? Uh, nothing less than that. Oh, less than that? Less than 30 gigabyte. Uh, that's probably the stuff that you would work with the majority of the time. But again, the rest of the stuff, you know, the supplemental data, the, the aerial imagery are things that you would use uh, later on. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable using GIS, then you would want to talk to us about, okay, what data set you want, what attributes you want, and we can create a reduced data set for your research question, and depending on the complexity, depending on how many variables, how many sites, we can give you a cost estimate so you can proceed with that. The terms of use agreement, I'm, I'm not going to go through that. It's really simple. The, the RID does not have any personally identifiable information. So there's really no need for IRB. We're using it mostly to keep track of how the data is used and utilized. So we ask you for a description of the, of the research question that you're trying to answer. We also ask you if you know, you're reviewing the data, if you find issues with the data, to report those back to us so we can see if this is something that can be fixed or not. But it's really a simple process. It takes a couple of days, and you should have your data ready. Uh, I, if you don't, if you're not aware of the RID, and I encourage you to visit our website. Uh, uh, you will have a copy of the slides that you can download. Here is the website to the Sharp 2 RID. It has a background section. It also uh, provides a description of the data, what existing data we have, the supplemental data, and so on. And then you can also request. Oh, sorry, you can request a copy of a sample RID request and get a sample uh, uh, data set that you can uh, use. Once you have the RID, or if you tell us uh, what data set you want, we kind of go through this uh, six-step process in terms of uh, looking at the data and, and trying to address uh, and determine uh, uh, the data set itself and also the processes we're going to use to produce that data set. So the main thing is, you know, what is your objective? Uh, what are you trying to answer? What is your research question? Uh, and then from that objective, we go out and determine the data needs. In some cases, we might not have all the data that you need, or we might have it for a smaller uh, area. Uh, but these are the things that you as a user of the data or us as supporting the data would be able to do. Then we will develop the data request using the RID in terms of determining which tables we're going to use, what are the data sources, the attributes that are there. Then we use GIS tools to process that data in terms of the, whether we're doing dynamic segmentations, whether we're doing overlay queries, whether we're using spatial proximity or simple just GIS queries to produce that data set. And then once you get that data set, you can take it to the next level in terms of the, uh, developing a request uh, for NDS data from VTTI, if that's kind of how the research is going. The RID, the roadway data, and the NDS data are linked through what we call a link ID. So we, once we produce a reduced data set for the researchers, there would be a link ID. If you provide that link ID to uh, VTTI, then they're able to provide you NDS data for the locations that you're interested in. And this process also works the other way around, too. And that's really the topic of our, of our third webinar, is to talk about the integration and the linking of the NDS and the RID. So I, we won't spend uh, a lot of time on that. Then the last step is to basically implement your research question, get all the data, and start doing your statistical model and your data analysis. So now I'm going to turn it uh, to Zach, and he's going to basically go through an example of using those uh, steps that we discussed 
to look at uh, finding ruler railroad crossings that are occurring on uh, horizontal curves. So with that, I'll turn it to Zach. And really, I think the, uh, the real objective here is to give you an idea about the process that you may walk through to determine the feasibility of uh, a research question. Um, if, if basically, if it is uh, maybe RID based, do you have enough locations that you may have trip data to be able to uh, answer your research question? So um, this example, we're going to use some basic GIS functionality, although the RID um, and Omar talked about the linear referencing system allows more advanced uh, GIS functionality as integration of the data. We'll focus on basic GIS functionality. We'll focus on um, use of multiple data sets and multiple, from multiple sources. We'll also talk about the importance of metadata and maybe the iterative process that you may go through in trying to identify the feasibility of a research question. So we have multiple steps in this process. We'll go through them relatively quickly, but really we are going to go through, we will add data within ArcGIS. We will look for appropriate alignment records, uh, the railroad crossings near those alignment records or horizontal curves. Um, we will refine that, again, to a rural location. Then we go in and investigate the results, and that's really kind of the iterative process that I was talking about. So the first slide really simply shows the addition of various data sets um, within ArcGIS. Here we're showing uh, signs, we're showing in, uh, census incorporated areas and places, we're looking at railroad crossings from the FRA database, we're looking at alignments, we're looking at the underlying routes, you can add imagery, you can add any of the data that's available um, within the RID, um, and also supplement that with any other data that you may have. In this next slide, we're simply showing uh, we've already refined uh, the data set to the alignment records that indicate that there's a horizontal curve. This is a simple attribute query that can be done. Uh, there's a field in the data set that will say indicates whether it's a tangent or not. We've limited the data set to only those records that indicate that they are a horizontal curve. And we're using a simple spatial selection to identify any railroad crossings that in this case are within, I believe, 100 or 150 feet of a horizontal curve. You can see that now we've refined the results of this spatial query limit us to 127 records, uh, which represents 127 railroad crossings that are at least near a horizontal curve. And this is within the state of Indiana. Then we can use the um, incorporated area and designated places data set to refine, uh, further refine the data set to only those records um, or only those crossings that are within an urban area. So in this case, we're simply uh, kind of doing a reverse spatial query and saying eliminate from consideration any of my crossings that I've selected that are within an urban area. This takes the, the total down from 127 to 44 records. Um, so this kind of, as you can see, this research question, we're kind of narrowing it down the possibility of locations that, that we may be interested in. And in that case, we were using multiple data sources where we had um, the census data for the incorporated area in places. We're using the FRA rail crossing database and the alignment data that's provided within the RID that was collected from the mobile van. This step, we're looking at refining the results. And so this is the importance of metadata. Uh, we have extensive metadata for all of the mobile data. As Omar said, we have some metadata, whatever was provided by the states, in this case, um, when we're looking at the FRA rail crossing data, they provided, um, we provided a link or access to uh, the metadata for that as well. So now I'm looking at, I had my, limited my crossings, now I want to refine it uh, using an attribute query to only those at grade crossings. So in this case, I was able to do an attribute query um, and selecting from my set of pre-existing uh, crossings that we'd identified. So now we're down to 30 crossing, so we've reduced it from 44 to 30, that were the at-grade crossings that were near a horizontal curve. Now, this is an important step that I think is uh, for research to be aware of. Um, so we have uh, these 30 crossings. It's important to kind of go in and maybe do some random identification and do some spot checking of these locations to identify, are you getting the results that you anticipate? If this is an example where it's a, a result that kind of violates expectations, uh, we are using some existing uh, aerial overlay options within ArcGIS. We're using um, 
an interface with Google Street View, which is an add-on, a free add-on that can be utilized as well. Um, for kind of a, a quick assessment of the data, this is the location that we identified where the crossing is actually uh, on a, a perpendicular roadway, but it's near enough to our RID route, that conflation process that Omar discussed, that crossing was accidentally conflated to our uh, network. So in this case, this is a location that we would not be interested in, and, and you can see the horizontal curve aspect as well. So uh, what we're doing then is identifying, are these locations that are really what I want to, to investigate as part of my research question? Here's another location that we did through a spot check where we were able to find um, it was happened to be, now it's a bike trail or a, a pedestrian trail. It's a crossing, so it ended up being an abandoned uh, rail line. So maybe with some advanced work and looking at the FRA metadata, then we'd be able to identify the fact that we do know there's some attributes in the database that do indicate that it was a rail crossing, but it's now abandoned. So there is a, there's a reason code in the FRI database that will uh, limit us down to only those that are active crossings. So now we've, again, limited the data set even further from 30 down to, the 18, to now 18. Um, ultimately, when we finally get to the, the final results, we found there are only four rail crossings that were on or near a curve. Um, again, this analysis, it may be iterative, it may evolve, and it may change as you kind of look through the data, work with the data, realize you maybe don't know enough about the data um, as you begin. Uh, the legwork up front is very important. Um, visual inspection is critical. That We're not recommending that you look at all the results, but we do some spot checking. We do recommend some spot checking uh, to, in, through this process. And through that spot checking we did, we were able to identify uh, removal of some of these locations that uh, were abandoned. Uh, it's important to understand the nature of the data and all the attribute data. Um, and again, as I said, use of metadata, use of metadata, use of metadata. Uh, we can see an example here uh, of actually using RidView. Um, the image to the lower right is actually RidView. Um, when we were initially doing the evaluation, we were using a Google Street View image interface. Well, we know that that Google Street View image was likely not taken at the same time that the drivers were on the site. So we want to go in and ultimately, before we make a decision, maybe do an assessment of the RID view for that location. And ultimately now, when we look at four railroad crossings, rural railroad crossings that were on or near a horizontal curve, are these four crossings, and this is only one state, but those are those four crossings significant enough for you to be able to perform an analysis? Um, now, again, you have other sites that you could look at, six, five other states that you could look at and review, and maybe you have different results in those states. This kind of helps you narrow down um, whether, that, whether you need to adjust kind of what your research question may be. Thanks, Zach. And as you can see, you know, this is, uh, Zach took us through the example in, in, in about 10 minutes. Uh, it would take uh, longer to, uh, to do that when, when you're actually doing the work. And, and Zach talked about a couple of things that are really critical. You know, you can use Google Street View right now, and it might be pretty close to you know when the experiment happened between 2011 and, and 2013. In a few years, that information is going to be out of date. So your reliance on Red View, the aerial images that are part of the RID, is going to be very very critical and very important. We've already seen sites where. Uh, uh, Google Street View or the Microsoft product shows, you know, we have, I think we saw a site where they show they have, we have rumble strips, but when we go back to our database, we really don't have that, and that's not an error. When, when the experiment was done, that segment of road did not have a rumble strip, and then the DOT went after that and installed one. So you really have to be careful in terms of your use of the data and all the resources that you have to make sure that those were the actual conditions in the field when, when, when the experiment happened. And that's why when, when we talk about the mobile data and we talk about RID view and the fact that 70% of the trips happened on those 25,000 miles, it kind of gives you a whole different feel in terms of how in five years or 10 years, 
how much outside of those 25,000 miles would you trust in terms of the additional data sources that we have? Uh, I know we have we have one question that we want to answer in terms of the supplemental data. Scholar, will uh, Scholar, do you want to talk a little bit about the other data that we collected? Yep. So Gabe just had a question of uh, what were the three sources of the data. For the weather data, we um, had the quality control, local climatological data, the QCLCD. Uh, we grabbed the data from the GHCN, which is the Global Historical Climatological ne Network. And then we also grabbed the uh, NOAA severe weather events for both zonal and county level uh, weather events in, in the study area and the surrounding counties. And so that's part of the reason why uh, we also didn't associate weather stations to the roadways was because uh, there might be a closer station that had that was part of the GHCN network, but a researcher might decide that a, a weather station with from the QCLCD a mile down the road is more accurate than that GHCN station. So we didn't feel comfortable making those decisions for the researchers. All right, thank you, Scott. So what I want to go through next is uh, three example research questions. These are actually projects that we're uh, involved in. We, we don't just manage the RID, but we're also involved in doing research with the SHARP-2 NDS study. So I'm going to talk about uh, just kind of the process. I mean, we're not talking about the research itself, but the process we went through to, uh, to be able to uh, request data to answer those research questions. So I'm going to talk about uh, roadway departure, I'm going to talk about the work zone, safety, and also speed limit uh, transition. So starting with the, with the roadway departure, our goal there is to basically study human uh, behavior uh, to see if we can uh, look at different countermeasures and how effective they are in improving safety. Uh, so the first thing we did is, okay, what different countermeasures we can, we can look at and how can we identify those from the existing data sources that we have. So we wanted to look at uh, rumbles, we wanted to look at shoulders, guardrail, RRPMs, ra uh, reflective raised pavement markers, uh, on pavement markings if they exist, and uh, chevrons. Uh, we wanted to look at locations that have it and locations that don't, and then link that Look, look, link those locations to the NDS data using link ID and then develop an NDS data request that we would send to uh, Miguel at VTTI and then get the data and work the research questions. So, so in this case, uh, if you guys remember, we said we have a rumble data set from the RID. So this is a pretty simple query. Show me all the locations that have rumbled and you can easily do that, and then you can limit that to, you know, I want it on two-lane roller roads or four-lane roller roads. I want it in shoulders, no shoulders, tangents, no tangents, and so on. So this is pretty straightforward. We can get uh, this information. The same thing is true for shoulders. The same thing is true for guardrails, because those were active use that we collected through the RID. Now we come to the RRPN, retroflective retro raised pavement markers. We did not collect that uh, through the RID. So how do we get that information? So one of the things that we did is we said, OK, we know we have the, the red view, which is the video log of those roads. We know which roads we want to focus on. We did a little bit of you know, getting uh, in touch with some state DOTs, and we figured, you know, OK, they started using RRPMs in these locations. So we identified locations that we are interested in and then we had students go in and view basically the images and determine if we have raised uh, pavement markers. And then we identified the beginning and ending of those locations. So now we're creating, it's not a comprehensive data set, but it's enough for us to request data from uh, VTTI. The same thing for on pavement markings. We had to go through the same process to determine those. So, so even though that data was not collected initially, the fact that we have the images helps us in terms of finding this information. It takes a longer time, of course. We might not have the ability to view all the images to be able to determine that. But for a specific research question in a specific area, you can definitely capture a lot of information that does not exist in the RID from those images. Chevrons, those are part of the MUTCD signs. 
So we are definitely able to find locations that have uh, Chevron. So that's kind of the roadway departure, the process that we went through to look at locations that have countermeasures and then get the NDS data associated with those so we can determine uh, changes in how the drivers behave and also in terms of safety. The second one is, uh, is, is work zone safety. And of course, you know, we got to start with work zones. There's nothing in the RID nor in the NDS experiment to say this is a location that has work zones. So we had to go to the 511 data set. And again, we only had it from five states. Uh, in our case, we wanted to uh, look at locations in, in rural areas. So we've uh, excluded, I think, the study site in Florida because its majority of it is urban. We ended up with, with four sites. And we went through the, the 511 data set to select work zones with specific duration, identify the location of those work zones, then basically identify the link IDs, request a sample from, uh, from the NDS data, and then view that NDS data to determine whether the work zone is actually a work zone, whether that work zone was active in terms of did we have equipment and did we have workers at the time that the drivers were driving, then we can refine that data request to be able to only select NDS data or participants from the NDS study on active work zone for the duration that we're interested in and then refine that data request from BTTI. We are actually in the process of that last step. We've already identified the, some of the work zones we're interested in. We requested the video from uh, VTTI. We got, I think, two or three traces for each one of those. And now we're going through the process of identifying the characteristics of the work zone, whether that work zone existed, whether it was active or not. And then based on those results, we can finalize our data request from VTTI. The third one is a speed limit uh, transition. Uh, this one uh, started by actually requesting data from the vehicle and the driver data. We wanted NDS data for high speed trips, so the request went to VTTI first in terms of giving give us trip traces where the speed limit is 55 or, or higher. And then we wanted to know the location of those trips, so we got using the GPS uh, we can go in and find where those trips occurred uh, in terms of uh, the roadway characteristics. And then from the reduced speed limit data set that I talked about, we can determine the speed limit. And now we can see you know, we have this speed limit. Here is what the drivers were driving and start looking at uh, uh, how the, the drivers are, are behaving on those high speed uh, roads. Uh, and then we can also look at if there is an impact to the roadway characteristics in terms of you know whether there is a median, shoulders, uh, median cable barriers, uh, the lane width, the number of lanes. Once we link those NDS strips to the RID, then we have all the roadway characteristics associated with that segment, and then we can further enhance the research that we're trying to do. So now Scholar will spend a few minutes talking about some general GIS capabilities and, and share with you uh, an example uh, from the New York study site. So uh, in this example, just kind of wrapping everything up, we just wanted to show the benefits of having the RID and uh, the ability of using it and querying things within a GIS environment. So something of a simple question that we could ask anybody in any of these states is just how many intersections are there within the study area? Uh, without the RID, it would be tough to know how many intersections we actually have. Uh, from here, we can do simple GIS queries to find out that we had around 6,799 intersections of the 44,000 that we collected during the all six study sites. So if you were interested in having quite a few intersections in New York, you know that you've got seven, or almost 7,000 to choose from. Then a next question of how many of these are actually a T intersection or a signalized intersection? This one was kind of perplexing at first that about two-thirds of the intersections that we collected in New York were T intersections. So 3,922 of those, almost 7,000 were T intersections. and 
like Zach did earlier, we did some investigating and confirmed, yeah, this is actually the case. There's a lot of T intersections or miss, uh, not aligned intersections in New York that cause a lot of T intersections to be there. Then another question of, so how many of those 3,922 are in urban areas? With the census database, we can find that out pretty quickly of uh, showing here all the, the urban areas using those census boundaries in GIS. We can find out that 3,000 of those 3,922 intersections are in urban areas of the T intersections. So these are just quickly quick ways that we can go through the RID and quickly identify intersections that would otherwise be taking a lot of time of reducing data manually that GIS gives us the quick capabilities of querying the database. Thank you, Scholar. And as I mean, as you can see, this doesn't require advanced GIS capabilities in this case. This is pretty simple queries. I mean, you still have to have the ability to work with, with ArcMap and be able to open files and, and, and do a simple query. So some, depending on, again, on your research question, uh, there is definitely uh, potential to be, to be uh, able to uh, analyze and, and, and work with that data. Our last uh, slide here is, you know, some of the additional RID resources that we're working on with the stack. One of the things that we have developed is the dynamic segmentation tool. We talked about dynamic, dynamic segmentation uh, being really a, a very critical tool to integrate data and produce these reduced data sets. Not everybody is an expert using dynamic segmentation. So uh, Federal Highway and the stack uh, asked us to develop a tool that allows novice GIS users to be able to integrate data from different sources, of course, within the RID. You still have to have the software. You still have to have the license to run ArcMap but you really don't have to go through the individual steps. All you need to do is basically select the data sources that you want, and the software would help you develop that dynamic segmentation and that reduced data set. Uh, since we're talking about reduced data sets, again, as part of our uh, support for the stack, uh, we're developing five reduced data sets. One of them is complete, which is a speed limit data set. The speed limit data set uh, covers the six study sites, we start with, you know, where we collect all the speed limit signs, and then we take data from uh, State DOT, HPMS, or Esri Naptic and build on that data set to develop a comprehensive speed limit data set. Uh, we actually worked with Battelle in Washington because they were one of the users that wanted that. They had uh, worked with the Washington State DOT and they've uh, got a, a, a limited speed limit uh, data set from them. They compared the accuracy in terms of what we provided to them, and we actually were at 95% uh, accuracy in terms of the speed limit data set. So we're confident in, in the data that is uh, in the RID, especially when it comes from the mobile data. We're also producing a curves uh, data set. Uh, an intersection, uh, complete intersection data set, lanes, uh, undivided, I think, and also uh, a median uh, reduced data set. All of these reduced data sets would be completed by the end of the project and would be available to all of the users that have a copy of the RID. We did talk about the video log or the RID uh, red view, I'm sorry. And then the last thing is, and I think I just touched on it a little bit, is, you know, reduced data sets for research questions. Again, if you don't have the GIS expertise in your team or if you don't have the capability to deal and work with GIS data, that doesn't mean you can't use the RID. You work with us uh, to uh, start your research question, go through the six steps in terms of the objective, identifying the data, the scope, and then we can definitely work with you to produce that reduced data set. Of course, there is a cost to the researcher because uh, TRB or Federal Highway does not really give us resources to be able to produce these data sets for individual researchers, but still the option is there to be able to, uh, to get that. Last thing here is uh, our uh, contact information. Uh, please feel free to contact us with, with any question, either myself, Zach, or Skyler. Uh, check uh, our uh, web page on the RID. Download the sample data set if you're interested, and let us know if we can help you with, uh, with any questions in terms of the data. 
Uh, with that, Brett, I turn it. Uh, oh, there's a question. Yeah, we're going to do. From, so uh, let's do. Let's do Q and A. So let's uh, have Ashley just give some directions for the sure. Q and A, and then we can get them verbally and go through on the chat box. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you wish to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone. A voice prompt on your phone line will indicate when your line has been opened. You may remove yourself from the queue at any time by pressing star followed by the digit two. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your headset before pressing the corresponding digits. Once again, it is star one. Hey, Brett. This is Charles. Are you? Hey, so Charles. While, while we have, go ahead, Charles. Oh no, no, I, I was disconnected. I just wanted to make sure I was I was back on the right line. Was, yep, you you're, you, you're back on. Uh, uh, so we have a Brett, few questions you want on here, Omar. Some yeah. of the chat chat box questions. Yeah, I can read them off to you. So the first question from the Road Weather Management Program. So what were the three sources of weather yeah, data? We, yeah, we already addressed that to Gabe. Gabe, did we address your question? Yeah, he did. He said thanks a lot, guys. All right. Okay. Um, and then did your uh, mobile data collection establish locations for rail grade crossings? No, it did not, but in, in our demonstration, we just wanted to show how you could use uh, other data sources. One other way that you could identify grade crossings is since there would be an MUTCD, MUTCD sign in every grade crossing that if we at least had mobile data collection, that could be used as a way to refine the actual locations of any grade crossings on those routes that we had mobile data. So we have multiple different ways you can approach um, how you form your research question and, and uh, extract the data. All right, thank you. And then a question, so from the New Hampshire DOT, so the department is updating the rumble strip stripe policy and standard designs, and they have a reactive approach, rumble strips installation based on the number of crashes in rural areas, and they're unable to demonstrate is the number of avoided crashes because of the proactive installation. So based on 11,852 miles of rumble strips collected, could a study provide the number of avoided crashes because of proactive installation? Is the RID NDS data available on drivers crossing the center line or weaving onto the shoulder and then alerted by rumble strip stripes that could demonstrate the potential life-saving benefits of the installations? Come yeah, that, that's a very good question. And I don't know if uh, Abdul Zinedine is on the line, but I know Federal Highway Tunnel Fairbank, and Charles, you might uh, want to chime in a little bit. They're, they're interested in doing this research. So uh, does the NDS have data in terms of when the drivers cross the center line or the edge line? Not directly, but they do have lane tracking. Uh, and also, uh, you can actually view uh, the, the trips where, those, uh, where we have rumble strips and determine that. So there are proxy measures in terms of drivers that have crossed the center line without rumble and with rumble. We are we're really not completely looking at this for our roadway departure, but this is something that is of interest to a lot of other researchers, and I think Federal Highway is, is interested in pursuing something like this. So I think, yes, the data sources in terms of the RID and the NDS would allow researchers to start looking at this question. Charles, do you want to say anything more on that? Yeah, uh, no, thanks, Omar. Um, yeah, we, we are trying to look at that. We actually have a call with uh, Omar next week. Um, but I would basically say to New Hampshire DOT to contact me, and we're more than happy to try to scope out a project with you, and we can include um, uh, Iowa State and Virginia Tech on the conference call to, to talk about that a little more. Um, I don't think it's a straightforward um, uh, research question. There has to be a little bit of processing on both ends. Um, but something should be able to be addressed. Um, so I, I think just reach out and use our contact for Charles Say. Uh, that should be in the downloaded presentation, and we're more than happy to um, uh, talk to you and discuss the project further. All right. Again, star one, if you want to ask a question verbally, we can open up your line. Uh, here's another question. So they're looking to, to access the dynamic segmentation tool. Charles, are we going to post that? Good. Definitely, it's part of the RID. Um, uh, Omar, you know, I was disconnected for a bit. Uh, did you talk about that you're able to purchase a copy of the RID? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the dynamic, again, the dynamic segmentation tool is something that, I mean, you would have to have a, a license of, of ArcMap to be able to use the functionality. Uh, we are, we have, uh, uh, we have a tool ready. We're refining it to include, uh, to make some changes to it. Uh, we actually just made it available to one researcher. But if you have a copy of the RID, uh, let us know, and we would be happy to. I think Federal Highway gave us permission to uh, release the dynamic segmentation tool to researchers at least early on right now, and we will update it by when the project is uh, complete. So just contact us and let us know, and we can go from there. Omar, just a point of clarity. Does the tool only work with a RID? Yes. OK. I had a question here from uh, Eric Lee. So notice that the linear referencing system route ID is not unique across different states. Is that, is that true? Uh, I, think, I think it is true that it isn't unique. Carl, there might be some duplicates from one state to the other. Uh, we intended it to just be used uniquely within that state as one at a time. So I'd have to confirm and get back to you. We'll get back to you, Eric, on this. All right, looks like some other folks are typing in some questions here. Uh, I did put the presentation there uh, in PDF form for download in the lower left of your screen. These sessions are being recorded, so they will be available afterwards. There will be a link we can provide for a temporary uh, recording, and then we're going to put them up in a permanent location, uh, likely on a stack website. There's a question from Rashid. Any pavement condition data uh, within the within the RID? Other than the HPMS information, which uh, I think has IRI uh, data, uh, no. So uh, if you're looking for you know friction data and things like that, that's something that you would have to contact the the DOT uh, for. I think also, Brett, there was a question about. Uh, uh, from David Nelson on the NDS has vertical acceleration that might pick up rumbles. I think that might be more of a Miguel question. Uh, I don't, I don't know that it's a question as much as a as a statement from David. Yeah, we we have vertical acceleration. It is potentially could pick up rumbles. We've never tried it, but um, I'm sure we could try at least. Definitely could test it out. Um, so, so Omar, just on the on the pavement condition, we have um, any pavement condition data that would have been reported back from states as part of their HPMS uh, data set. Yes, that's the only thing we have. We did not request uh, pavement condition information from the state DOTs. Uh, I don't think we received any. Uh, I mean, we, you would have to look at the existing data and see if we if we got any information on on pavement condition. But I know we would have HPMS data, and and that includes uh, roughness or pavement serviceability uh, index PSI or PSR pavement serviceability rating. Okay. And it looks like that dynamic segmentation tool. Uh, they have a copy of the RID. It's from Wyoming. Um, the copy that you have doesn't. I don't know when you purchased it, doesn't have the dynamic segmentation tool in it because that's just been finished. So um, I think as part of your agreement in purchasing the RID, you can contact Omar directly. Isn't that right, Omar? Um, yes. Related to the tool? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So that would be it. Contact Omar directly and uh, then we'll get a copy. Yeah, it looks like uh, back on the pavement condition, looks like the state of Florida provided pavement condition information. Yep, that was Indiana. And Indiana provided some some friction data. All right. So I'll, I'll read the next. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Omar. Continue on that. No, that's good. So uh, Gina is asking about data. Um, does data exist outside of the six study areas? or will it be addressed in future updates to the RID study? 
I'll just clarify that the six study areas in terms of NDS data, there is not going to be any more NDS collection. Um, and as Omar had said, there's, uh, we had there's a variety of sources of the RID data. The new data that was collected with the mobile data collection vans, there's not any more of that. But uh, Omar, maybe you could talk about how the um, center line expands beyond the beyond the sites, but the limitations in the data associated. Yeah, with that. yeah. So, so in terms of the LRS, uh, we went beyond the six study size because we we knew that you know participants are not limited to just the six study size in terms of where they drive, but there's very limited data. I know we have some uh, functional class. Uh, not the federal or state functional class you're used to, but the, the ESRI NAPTIC functional class in terms of the, you know, the hierarchy of the road. There is direction of travel. There is some speed limit data and some inter not intersection, lanes, la lanes, lanes data and access control. So, so that data exists for a lot of miles. I mean, uh, don't go looking for it in New York City because we've excluded that. Uh, we, so we excluded major urban areas because of the large quantity of data and its impact on the size. But you know you will have that minimal data for more than a million miles. And just for clarity, you excluded a, a large urban site if it happened to be outside of our study area. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry. I mean, like. In Buffalo, no, we have all the all the roads in in Buffalo, and all the roads in the study sites were included as part of the LRS, whether they're your residential street or your interstate. So Gina, may let us know if that answers your question, or maybe even more specifically, what you're looking for in terms of uh, expanding beyond the six study areas. I've posted the dates for the uh, upcoming uh, Sharp 2 NDS related training sessions. January 18th uh, is the NDS and RID integration session. And then on February 8th, uh, we're going to have NDS, RID research and outreach opportunities. We'll discuss that then. Yeah, that will be the last one. And Brett, they have to register for each one of these individually, correct? Correct, yeah. Go in and uh, register for each one individually. The links are there on the left. Okay, so Gina said, uh, yeah, she's interested in California. I see. I understand. Thank you, Gina. And, Brett, we have the phone lines are, are open for calling, correct, for questions as well as... Yeah, so they, it, it hit star one, star one, and then the operator can open up your line to ask a question there or can continue to put in the chat pod. I think we prefer them verbally though, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I guess while we're waiting, I'll 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 just mention um, regarding California, you know, Gina, we had um, uh, Sharp Two had actually spent nineteen months trying to recruit um, the sites uh, that would run the run the NDS study. And um, we were specifically looking, when you look at the map, for those areas that, that, that seem to be a, a little wanting in terms of the study area as well as California. We just actually got no, um, uh, we got no proposals. So. Uh, so um, the webinar recording. Um, two ways to access the webinar recording. Uh, Brett will have a a temporary recording that I think lasts 60 days soon after um, this one ends. We can send that out to you if you email us. Uh, the other place it will be posted um, in, uh, as an archive will be on the STAC website. And you'll always be able to access all the recordings for this webinar series, as well as the webinar series we held just before this related to the Sharp 2 Natural Sick Driving Study Pooled Fund on the STAC website. Uh, it's just that the recordings will not be on the website until sometime after the TRB annual meeting.
curious about when the study started, which SHARP-2 cycle. Um, this is Susie Lee from the EPI. Yeah. We, uh, in terms of the naturalistic driving study, we began collection in October of 2010 um, at one of the sites, and we ramped up across the six sites. I think we had them all online and going by January of 2011. And by December, we also had a similar ramp down process, but by December of 2013, uh, we were, all of the subjects were out of the study. So it was a little over three years of data collection. I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly when the RID data were collected. And in regard yeah, to that, we, we started also, we did a pilot in 2011. I can't remember exactly how many miles, but I think over 500 miles. And then the majority of the data was collected in 2012 and 2013. Uh, we also went out and did a cleanup after you know everything was done to make sure that uh, most of the crashes that occurred during Sharp 2 had mobile data uh, collected. So we went out and collected uh, additional sites for that. But the majority of the work was completed in 2012 and 2013. And, and I'm not sure if Gina is referring to the implementation, uh, the Sharp 2 implementation program that started after oh. TRB uh, finished the research. So um, yeah, this, if it's if it is the IAP, we're in the second yeah. cycle of the IAPs for safety at least. Right, and, but, none, but the data were not collected. They were collected no. before any of the the quote unquote implementation program uh, cycle started. Yeah, so that they were collected under when TRB was uh, managing um, the four research programs: uh, safety, reliability, capacity, and renewal. Gina, Gina's okay. Any other questions? Well, I also wanted to, while we're waiting for some questions, just to say that the, the stack, um, uh, Brett, are, were, are my slides downloadable too, or with the contact information? Yeah, this, yeah your slides should They're be on the front end. Okay. Yeah, should be on the front end of that. I'll double check that, but they should be on the front there. Okay, very good. Uh, so just a reminder, you can reach out, reach out to us with any questions. Uh, related to either the data or if um, uh, or if you're planning your own project scoping that out we're, we're here for you on that and we're also here to um, encourage you to participate in the sharp 2 NDS pool fund study Omar or Miguel any other information you want to provide on the um, upcoming even maybe the TR, in the TRB workshop, maybe you could say. Yeah, something. we do. We do have a Sunday workshop at TRB to uh, talk about the NDS and RID. We we also have three uh, researchers that will be presenting their work. They're part of what we what Federal Highway terms as broad agency announcements. That was Sharp Two related. So we will have those three researchers there presenting. We'll also have presentation and demos on the NDS and the RID side. And at the end, we will have a panel discussion in terms of question and answers with the researchers, the BAA researchers, and also the VTTI and, and C3. So I encourage you guys to uh, attend that. It's uh, going to be Sunday afternoon, I think from 1 to 4.30 or something like that. And then the third webinar will be basically addressing how the NDS and RID are linked and how do you go back and forth between the two data sets. today and um, as we mentioned please sign up for the for the next couple uh, sessions here and uh, be on the lookout for that TRB session you can download the presentation um, as I mentioned you can email us to get a link to the recording and um, we'll also post it more permanently later in January on the stack website Charles any closing thoughts yep. no thanks uh, great job everybody and uh, appreciate everybody for tuning in Thank you, everybody. And Happy New Year. Thank Bye. you. Take care.
And that concludes our conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using the AT&T teleconference service. You may now disconnect.